Welcome back. This is Brett with Baseball Prospect Analysis, and it's been a while, but hopefully you guys enjoyed the new intro and logo I've designed. Just another small thing I've done to improve this channel, and I hope to continue improving it as time goes on. Now, let's get to the video. So today we have Jason Groom, a 2016 LHP out of Barnegat, New Jersey, sporting a 6'6", 180-pound frame. He sits mid to high 90s with a straight fastball, developing changeup, and a sweeping breaking ball that features tight spin. Now remember, this is a high school scouting report, and a 95-plus fastball with above-average breaking stuff will make you dominant in just about any major high school conference or travel tournament. However, other than the obvious velocity, many other traits are what made Jay look so promising. For one, he could spot his pitches very well for his age, especially compared to other high school power arms. Then add the fact that his frame just screams projection at you. Six foot six and only 180 pounds. So much room to grow and a large possibility of another velo spike taking him into triple digits. But most impressive was his delivery, often described as easy and effortless. It's not every day you see a 17 year old lefty touching 96, but many fans and scouts alike had never seen a 17 year old do it so easily. One of the hardest things to teach a young power pitcher is how to throw hard with low effort. But Groom did not come off as a power pitcher. He much more resembled a true frontline starting pitcher who just happened to throw at an elite velocity. These qualities earned him a number one overall ranking nationally by perfect game and a lottery draft pick status. Groom was on everybody's wish list and it was clear his commitment to Vanderbilt was no longer a realistic outcome. Perfect game described him as just a special, special arm. And one MLB GM even stated he might be the best high school prospect since Clayton Kershaw. Now normally I have an issue with scouts and GMs comparing preps to pros or making outlandish claims about a 17 year old. But this one was fairly accurate and reasonable. It's strictly an opinion, not a declaration, and described his current talent level rather than predicting his future with an expectation driven statement. All in all, Groom was the star of the 2016 class with a ceiling that reached higher than others while on a floor, stories above many. Before we get into draft day and his pro career, we definitely need to backtrack a bit and talk about his off-field issues and transfer-related suspension. After an attention-grabbing sophomore season at Barnegat, Groom opted to transfer to the powerhouse IMG Academy. He performed extremely well, posting a 5-0 record with a 1.22 ERA, coupled with 81 strikeouts, while walking only 9. IMG staff referred to him as a professionally mature player who's highly competitive but low-key off the field. Following this impressive season, Groom made the head-scratching decision to transfer back to Barnegat for his senior year. Jay claimed the decision was significantly based on his growing homesickness. However, just like when any other major prep star makes questionable, rash decisions, rumors tend to sprout from the grapevine. Talk of Groom being expelled or forced to leave IMG began to circulate. Many allegations claiming he was caught with marijuana spread online and through word of mouth. The most common story found online, albeit mostly on Reddit, claims he was caught by IMG, and they agreed on keeping silent on the matter as long as he left following the last semester. Now remember people, this is Reddit, the same site that features groups of people talking about lizard-human hybrids and Bigfoot's whereabouts but it would be incredibly naive to dismiss any of these allegations fully, especially with the information and events that would occur following this transfer. Groom's transfer would initially come at a price. Due to New Jersey transfer rules, he would end up causing his team multiple forfeited games and an additional seven games for himself. Many started to question why he would transfer back knowing this would happen. Transfer rules in high school are usually pretty well known by involved parents and coaches alike. Many state prep organizations, even mine, the WIAA, have transfer rules with little to no leeway to prevent super teams and parents transferring their kids for solely athletic purposes. I personally doubt Barnegat's coach, Groom's parents, and even Jay himself were unaware of the rules. This does make it more convincing that he had actually been asked to leave IMG with no direct backup plan. More talk by professional scouts this time seemed to lean that direction as well. More rumors of marijuana use, alcohol consumption, and an inflated ego started to come afloat. Shortly before the draft as well, Groom changed his commitment to Chipola, a junior college in Florida. Many teams already questioning his signability ended up crossing his name out once his agent announced his magic number was a $4 million signing bonus. The once projected top five pick in the draft 
ended up falling to pick number 12, claimed by the Boston Red Sox. The Red Sox hoped the intrigue of being close to home and being one of his favorite teams would lead to a somewhat signable draft pick in Groom. After much negotiation, they agreed on a $3.65 million signing bonus. If you ask me, $3.65 million for a number 12 pick? Groom definitely made the best of a situation that was less than ideal. And just as the antics seemed to have concluded, more were quickly on their way. Following a six-inning 2016 pro stint, mostly due to the amount of innings he logged in the senior campaign, he ended up arriving at the 2017 spring training fairly unprepared. The Red Sox had verbally made it apparent how displeased they were with his condition upon arriving. Shortly after, he made his first start of 2017. This led to an immediate intercostal strain, sidelining him for two months. This was followed by forearm soreness in August, causing him to be shut down for most of the remainder of the season. On top of all this, Jason's father was arrested on July 10th of 2017 and later charged with possession of meth, heroin, and cocaine with intent to distribute. Thankfully, it was revealed that Jason had no connection with any of this and would ultimately not impact him directly, other than the obvious emotional toll this could cause anyone in that situation. At this point, I'd like to step off the rubber a bit and give my take on all this controversy. Because yes, in two short years, there was a lot of it. First off, let me say I don't fully buy the homesick transfer story. Too many things don't add up, and if he had another dominant year at IMG, it would have only secured his initial draft stock. Whether the allegations are true, I couldn't tell you. I'd hope they weren't, but lots of signs point to the possibility that they actually were. Either way, you got $3.65 million as a number 12 pick. There is no reason in my mind that would justify showing up to your first spring training in the shape that he did. And I truly believe his lack of shape in spring may have led to his injury-filled 2017 season. Now for his father, I don't believe we should associate that at all with Groom. We all know people who have had family or friends go off the deep end. And Jason should not be defined by his father's actions. He should be defined by his own character and decisions. In October of 2017, Groom made quite possibly one of the best decisions of his career. He opted to move to Fort Myers, Florida, bringing his family with. This way, he could be fully focused on training while still having his family close by. Red Sox superstar Chris Sale happened to hear about Groom's move through Boston's mental skills coach, Laz Gutierrez. I really hope I'm saying that right. Sale decided to invite the young talent to work out together, hoping to help guide him through a productive offseason. Something Groom truly needed. Sale recalled his first couple weeks in the bigs was greatly influenced by then-vets Jake Peavy and Mark Burrell. According to Sale, they had a major impact on his initial path and development early in his career, and helping Groom was a way of keeping the tradition alive, as well as helping a young prospect within the organization that had superstar potential. Groom initially thought it was a prank and was shocked to find out it was actually true. What followed was truly a blessing. A bond between Groom and Sale was created through workouts, common interests, and family members. Those being Groom's five-year-old twin brothers and Sale's seven-year-old son. This seemed to greatly advance Groom's off-season work ethic as well as his character. The off-season ended with Sale impressed with Groom's desire to learn and dedication to training. And Groom with a new understanding of what a true off-season should entail as well as a new mentor that can help him throughout his career. All in all, if we get to see a dominant Groom at the MLB level someday... I think many fans and coaches alike will owe Chris Sale a thank you card or two. Unfortunately, like many young high-octane pitching prospects, Groom underwent Tommy John surgery on May 15th of 2018. This was following a promising showing in spring training of that year. Nearly 16 months later, Groom addressed the media concerning his recovery process. Stating his goals for the 2020 season were to throw as many innings as I can and just stay healthy. I've got a brand new arm basically, so I know if I can maintain it, the sky is the limit. In 2020, Groom was sent to Pawtucket to work out with other Sox prospects in a development-based environment. He has been working with Pawtucket pitching coach Paul Abbott. Abbott explained his bullpen so far had been very deliberate and controlled. The organization as a whole would like to see him amp up his side pens before facing AAA and big league talent. Abbott explained that at this point in Groom's career, he needs to face advanced hitters to develop properly. Eventually, Groom did face live hitters, and I'm not sure myself if he competed in a live inning or not. 
He may have, but I did not find any report of it. As of December 14th, 2020, the only new info we have is that Groom had been added to the 40-man lineup to protect him from Rule 5. Rule 5 is a draft that happens every December involving four or five-year prospects. Teams can sign them for a fee of 100 k to their current club. That's a simplified explanation, at least. So I know this has been a long one today, guys, but I felt all the information I provided was needed. I'll try and keep this conclusion short and to the point. My main point I want to emphasize is don't sleep on Jason Groom. I would not be surprised to see him in the MLB in 2022 or in a small stint in 2021. He needs to face big league hitters sooner than later, and I wouldn't be shocked if they bring him in for an inning or two late in the 2021 season. Maybe in a game that's out of reach or lacking significance to their playoff seed. Now, regarding his past, I think everything that happened was actually needed. I'm a firm believer in the ideology that you need to lose multiple times in order to learn how to win consistently and properly, whether that be in a literal game or life in general. Groom has seen his share of scrutiny and controversy. However, I think the road he traveled may have advanced his maturity and character faster than your average prospect. The major factor of this change in advancement, I believe to be the 2017-2018 offseason he had with Sale. I believe this caused him to reflect and learn from his past as well as gain a new understanding on how a true MLB superstar carries himself. I also believe the controversy was overhyped. Compared to basketball and football, baseball tends to be looked at as more of a Puritan sport. And only recently have we seen large personalities such as Tim Anderson, Bryce Harper, and Derek Dietrich rise to fame and acceptance. Love or hate them, they are here to stay. Well, as long as Dietrich gets back to producing with that bat again. You also have to take into account that he was very young and seemed to have come from a somewhat troubled family where drugs and alcohol at the time seemed to be fairly accepted. Anyways, I'll close this out by saying we should all be excited for this kid's future and the potential he still possesses. I'm not a big Jersey guy, but once he makes his MLB debut, I can guarantee you my bank count will be a few hundred dollars short and I'll have a nice jersey hanging in my office and I might even wear it a couple times. If you guys made it all the way to the end, I'd like to thank you for tuning in and hopefully learning something new about this top prospect. I'm planning to release one video per week every Monday going into the foreseeable future. If you enjoyed this breakdown, I highly suggest you subscribe to the channel and click that bell to be notified when new videos are released. And lastly, if you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like to show some support for the channel. Also, comment any thoughts you have on the video or any prospects you'd like me to break down in the future. And until next time, have a great rest of your day, guys. I'll see you later.